Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. Again, anytime we, we gather together, uh, all of us, uh, we, we just thank you for being a part of our fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the love that we have for each other. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction that we get from just opening up the scriptures and taking a look at these letters that you've written to us. And we just give you all the praise and the glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I, I said, we, we actually went, got through verses 8 and 9 last week. Uh, but I wanted to kind of back up a little bit because I, it's just, it ties in so well with the next paragraphs that I wanted to back up and kind of keep it in context. So we're going to start in verse, uh, verse number eight. And this is what it says. It says, finally. Now, of course, you know, that doesn't mean that he's done. Okay. It's just like a preacher saying my last point, And then they talk for another half hour. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. Having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And the brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are in Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What a great ending to a letter. What a great. And if you remember, when we started this a few weeks ago, actually a couple months ago now, um, we said that this, this letter to the Philippians was going to address some of the struggles in the church. It, this was a church, like all of our churches, that, that was struggling with a few things. There were, uh, there were people that there were odds with some of the teachings of Paul. There were women that were at odds, even though they had been faithful in ministry, they were at odds with each other. And Paul is trying to give them instruction, trying to give them encouragement. And, and in chapter four, he starts wrapping things up. And he starts wrapping things up by saying, those things that are pure and holy and good and a good report, think on the things that are good in your life. Just remember how much you have to be thankful for. My wife, who is the spiritual one in our family, okay, for those of you who know Carol and I, she is the spiritual one. I've got the training, but let me tell you, there's, she's so close to God. And, and she reminds me of the things I say. You know, that's the problem is that everywhere I teach, she comes with me and she remembers the things I say. And then she reminds me what I said in order to apply them into my life. Okay. It's just kind of the, it's the cross I carry. It's just the, it's just the cross I carry. <laughs> and I, where we live, we live over on Celebration Avenue. Behind us is, is Mel, uh, Mulberry Street. And there's a, there's a beautiful park there. There's a beautiful park with a fountain and it's got beautiful flowers and people come from all around the area and they take wedding pictures there. They take prom pictures there. Young girls that are 15, 16, 17 that want some nice pictures for their family. They bring photographers there and they set up their lights and their cameras and they take pictures in this park. 
and it's right behind me. <clears throat> well, wouldn't you know that the park is a one way around it. So when, if I'm leaving from my house here in the bubble celebration, which I mean, it's only, a, I only drive, I have to drive a mile. I mean, it isn't, I'm not going very far, but I have to come out of my parking lot and then I come to the park and I have to go around the park. It can't go straight because it's a one way. So I have to go around the park and then come over to the school. And sometimes there's kids going to school and they get in my way and I have to stop. So you see what I'm getting to, you know? So I'm just driving with my wife and I say something like that. It's like, ah, you know, this park, you know, it's, it's one way. It always slows me down. And Carol says, Think on those things that are lovely, that have good report. If there's any virtue, think on those things. You know, she's using the scripture against me, you know. But it's, but it's such a good reminder. And actually, I got to tell you, based on my wife's encouragement, I'm doing that. I get to the park and out loud, even if I'm by myself, I say, oh, God, I'm so thankful. We got this beautiful park. It's, it's only 10, 15, 100 feet away from my door. I get to live here. I get this beautiful park. People come from all around to be here, and I, I get to see it every day, every day. Well, that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, you know, your life on balance, it's got good and it's got bad. There are some struggles in the church. There's going to be some struggles with you personally. All of us are going to go through struggles in life, but I want you to understand that you want to think on the good things. Because if you keep your so yourself focused on these things, verse 9 says, these things which you've learned and received and heard from me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You see, that's what we want. I mean, the main thing we really want in life is peace. And if we have peace with God, we've got it all. Let me tell you. I mean, if you've got that, you've got everything. Our, uh, the church I was in down in, down in Pittsburgh, <clears throat> excuse me, had a jail ministry, had a jail ministry. There was a number of guys that had gotten um, involved with one of the local jails. This was a county jail and had gotten, gone, through, gone through all the background checks and gone through some training. And they were allowed to go into the jail and have Bible studies with some of the inmates, which is wonderful. Um, I mean, even in Matthew 25, it says one of the things is you came, I was in prison and you came and fellowship with me. It's, a, it's something we want to do. Come on, Talitha, we got a seat for you. So they had this jail ministry and, and what they said was true. I only went a couple times with them. I was busy, but, but I, I wanted to go a couple times and kind of experience it. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but I, can, I really appreciate what they were doing. Um, but I did get to meet some of these guys and, and they told me, let me tell you, after I've met Christ because of these people, and now that even though I'm in prison and I've met Christ, I feel more free and I've got more peace than I've ever had before in my life. And they're in prison. They're, they can't go out of their bars. They have to stand at attention. They have to let somebody open the door for them. I mean, they're, they're prisoners and they're going to be there sometimes for a long time. But be, because of the God of peace will be with you because they're able to focus on those things. They're able to focus on those things. And that's why I wanted to come back and, and remind you that this is key. I mean, this is key when, as we go through life. You want to you meditate. You want to think on the good things in life. You want to remember. And, and there's so many of them. You know, we, did, we had Thanksgiving not too long ago. One of the traditions in our house, and I'm sure a lot of houses, is we'd always have to find ways, find so, something to say that we were thankful for. Something that we were thankful for. And we did a couple of different things when the kids were growing up. One of the things we did is, is we would put little things that we're thankful for the kids. And we would kind of give them praises and things. We'd kind of roll it up on a little scroll and they have to read it, you know, what we thought about them. But you want, to, you want to do that. You want to find ways to be able to be thankful for the things that you've got. You know, and, there's, and people know that. You don't have to be a Christian to know that. I mean, there's, there's people that know that, the idea of, of focusing on the good things. We talked a little bit about positive thinking last week in Norman Vincent Peale, and I didn't, I didn't want to end with that. I really wanted to bring the biblical truth, which is it's the peace of God. It's the, it's the peace of God that you get by meditating on these things.
Do you find it easy to do or is it hard to do? Is, is this something you do? You don't have somebody like Carol reminding you all the time. <laughs> yeah. But you find it? I mean, I mean we all we all go through difficult times, you know. You know, people that we know have been in, in and out of the hospital and do you find it easy or hard to focus on good things? A little bit of each? Yeah. I, I, think, I think it takes practice. I think like anything in life, I think you need to practice it. You need to, what do they say? You got to fake it till you make it, you know? You got you to gotta say it. You got to say it before you believe it. You got to believe it. Most of you know that I, I used to work for Ford Motor Company, and uh, it was a good career. I liked it. It was, it was a good company. Uh, I don't have anything bad to say about it. I, en I certainly enjoyed driving a new car all the time. And, and one of the things was back in the 70s, late 70s, Ford came out with a slogan, and it was, quality is job one. You remember Ford saying that in their commercials? Quality is job one. Well, let me tell you, we had to fake it till we made it, because our quality was horrible in the late 1970s. It was, it was horrible. And, and I can tell you as employee, I saw the worst of it. I mean, I took delivery of cars that were a Mercury in the front end and a Ford in the back end. I mean, it was that bad. I mean, they were coming off the same assembly line and they just kind of got them jumbled up. And there was a Ford emblem on the front and a Mercury emblem on the back. I mean, you can't get much worse than that, you know? I had, in fact, my dad, my dad who was awesome, my dad used to work for Chrysler, then he came to work for Ford. And when my wife and I got married, we bought a Ford vehicle, of course. We got a Ford vehicle. My dad had the A-Plan, which was a good way to buy cars. So we bought our first brand new car. And it was horrible. I mean, it looked good, but I mean, it wouldn't start when it rained. It, you know, we just had all kinds of problems. And you know what my dad said? He said, I'm so, th so thankful that it happened to you rather than a real customer. <laughs> He was a company man. And did you tell your daddy that that is the cool thing? Yeah, that, I tell you. <laughs> but, but the reason I bring it up is because we went on a, a quality drive. And we started talking about it all the time. We started talking about it in the plants. We started talking about how important quality was. And that it started with every individual in the company. And it eventually took hold. And by the mid-1980s, by the mid-1980s, Ford had caught up and surpassed the American companies and was competing directly with like Toyota for quality. And in many cases, in many studies, it showed that the initial quality on some of the Ford vehicles was even better than some of the Japanese vehicles. We had caught up. We had caught up. But we had to fake it until we made it. And I think that's also with this. I think, I think the idea of of thinking on the things that are pure and lovely and a good report and a virtue and praiseworthy, I think we just got to do it. And you keep doing it until there's no room in your life for despair and agony and frustration and pain. You just squeeze it out. You just squeeze it out. And, and really, that's a good preamble to what he fits into. Exactly right. Yep. I wanted to back up and do it because there's a couple of there's a couple of verses in here that are often <clears throat> mentioned. Okay, um, verse thirteen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now it's a great verse. Don't get me wrong. It's you can use that verse at all times. You often see you often see it with people that are achieving great things. The athletes they. They, you know, they, they do the dance in the end zone, right? You know, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's Philippians uh, 4.13. You know, it's, it's I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or people that are launching new companies and they're, they're, and they're going to achieve and they're going to be a huge company, very successful. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the context here. Uh, <laughs> that is not the context here. Paul is telling us in verses 8 and 9 that we got to think on good things, okay, because there's a lot of nasty stuff that goes on in your life. And then Paul says this. He says, I, I thank you that you've actually uh, given me an opportunity. You've given yourself an opportunity to support my ministry. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I, I know that you, you wanted to do this, but you lacked the opportunity. 
but I'm giving you the opportunity. Here's, here's, my, here's my offering basket, right? Here's my envelope, so you can, you can support me. And he's saying, here's the thing. He says, not that I speak in regard of need. See, Paul is focusing on the things that are positive as well. Paul knows that he's had some difficulties because he says that. He says, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. He's focusing on the good things. I know how to be abased. Now, if you don't know where the abased means, it means lowered. It means, it means a guy that's so low, he's playing handball against the curb, right? I mean, he, he's, he's so low, he's looking up at, at the heel of a, of a shoe. He's, he's lower than a snow, snake's belly, right? I mean, there's all kinds of sayings. He is abased. He is low, lower than low. He says, I know how to, I've been abased. I know how to abound everywhere and on all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. You see, there were times when Paul was hungry. He didn't have the funds to be able to sustain him, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, you know, What's the, what's the saying today? saying? He says, I've, I've been rich and I've been poor. And I tell you, it's better being rich. Right? <laughs> but Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. He says, I've been rich and I've been poor. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, the context for this verse isn't the athletes that are accomplishing everything. It's not the rich man that's wondering how he was able to get so rich. It isn't talking to the second, the third most richest guy in the world that's got billions of dollars. He's richer than Donald Trump, okay? And, he does, and he's saying, I can do all things through Christ. Well, that's good, but that's not the context here. The context is, is I was hungry. I've been abased. I've been low. But let me tell you, I've learned whether I've got good stuff or I've got bad stuff in my life, I can still do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's that's the context here. That's the context here. So Paul is, you know, it's, it's kind of like Paul's got a carol, you know. He's got somebody speaking to him, and it's him. Paul is preaching to himself. He's, there's, there's somebody in his life, and it's him. That's, he's reminding himself who he is, that, that he can do all things through Christ. Do you like that? I, I mean, I, like I said, I think that all, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that verse. And I, I don't mind seeing an athlete or a very wealthy person or somebody that's got everything going for them, giving the honor to God. That's a, that's a glorious thing. That's, a, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But we should understand that context is actually for us as well. Because I'm not going to have a, a what, I, what I say is I'm working on my third million because I gave up on the first two, right? <laughs> you know. I just <laughs> send me money every month don't die <laughs> yeah, okay. there's we all have our own prayers Indeed. pastor we all have our own prayers <laughs> well yeah except verse verse 20 says that too it says all the saints greet you especially those are in caesar's household yeah, right. <clears throat> you know while paul's in prison he's preaching to the palace guard yeah. you know and he's yeah, he's doing whatever he can whatever he is you know caesar he's, ain't gonna be with you <laughs> uh, so much fun. So then let's go, let's go on. So it says here, it says, uh, verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know that also in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Paul, Paul wants, he wants to go back because he had just basically said that his ministry is suffering. I mean, that's what he's been saying. He's, he's writing to his supporters, okay? He's writing to his supporters. He's writing a, a fundraising letter. And he's saying, oh, it's really bad. I, you know, there's days I go without a meal, right? There's, there's, days, there's days I feel so low. I, I, I don't know what I can do. I just have to rely on God because I obviously can't rely on you, right? Now, he doesn't say that. And to make sure they don't think that's what he's saying, he says, nevertheless, you have done well. You've done well. Remember, I, I don't want you to feel badly. You were one of the people that supported me. And I thank you for that because you were able to come along when, when nobody else was doing this. You stepped up and, and, and you gave. And I, and I appreciate that. That's what, he, that's what he's saying. He says, he says, you know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only, you only, you were, you were there for me. And, and so I, I, I thank you for that. And I like that. 
I like that. He doesn't want them to feel badly that he was abased or he was hungry. He wants them to feel confident that they were able to, to support some of his needs. And I think that's important. I think that's important. You know, sometimes, sometimes we play the Good Samaritan, don't we? I mean, sometimes we, we see somebody that's, that's suffering, somebody that needs something, and we really go out of our way. Have you ever done that? You sometimes go, you can't do that with everybody. You, you really can't. You, can't. you can't adopt every cat on the neighborhood, right? You can't, you can't bring in every sore puppy. You can't do that. You can't help everybody. But every now and then, you can help somebody. You can help somebody. And here's the thing, is that, is that, when, you, when, you do that when you do that, you don't want them to feel somehow that you're doing something all that unusual, even though you are even though you are. And, and Paul's trying to do that. And he's, he's encouraging them. He's encouraging them because they took in poor Paul. You know, Paul was just getting started in ministry. Nobody was really giving to him, and they did it. He doesn't want them to feel too badly or too well. And I think that's a good balance. I think that's a good balance. But sometimes we do that. We, sometimes we do provide some aid, uh, and we go beyond and, and above the call of duty. <clears throat> he says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. And Paul makes sure they understand. Not that I, I seek that gift. Not that I seek that gift. I was, uh, I was upstairs and I, and I passed out some of our daily bread. And one of the, one of the sweet ladies upstairs said, said, I want to pay you for that. I want to pay you for that. And I said, oh, there's, there's no need. There's no need because uh, we, we, have, we have funds and we, we take care of that. You know, people give, we give, everybody gives. It, it's all good. And then I told her a story, which is true, that, that our daily bread, this, this organization out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, when, when I asked for 100 of these, and I'll go through 100 of these between here and next door and a few other places, we'll go through almost 100 in, in a month. When I asked for them, and you have to ask for them separately, you just can't go online and just check a box because I'm asking for a, a full box, and I wanted it large print as well. I asked for it, they sent it to me. I didn't pay for it. I didn't send them a check with it. There was nowhere to, to say, here's, the, here's my money. Now, when they sent it to me, they sent me a letter, not unlike Paul's letter, saying, this is our ministry. Thank you so much. Did you know that last year we sent out 7.6 million copies of these? You know? And it's amazing that when we give these copies out, we always have the funds to be able to do it. And we want to thank you in advance for anything that you may want to get. I love that. What a wonderful way to run a ministry. So they sent me a little letter, and, and we wrote a check. We wrote a check, and we sent it off. The middle, yeah. yeah, and there's one right in the middle. Yeah, so there's all kinds of, and, and that's, that's a wonderful way. That's a wonderful way to be able to do it. We, we give because God has given to us. Now, because God's given to us, Paul's saying, because Paul, God's given this, and I, and, I'm not, and I know how to abound. I mean, I can do all things through Christ. So it isn't that I have any need, but here's the thing. If you'd like to give, you're welcome to. And that's what Paul's saying. The Christian history magazine. Yeah. Theology matters the same way. We do the same thing with, um, with Operation Christmas Child. With Operation Christmas Child, if you read their material, what, they're, what they ask for is they, they ask for about $9, $10, $10 with every one of the, one of the boxes because there's, it's expensive. I mean, they've got to pack these things up in North Carolina. They've got to put them on an airplane. They've got to ship them to... Bosnia or Africa or wherever they're going, China, they're going all over the country, all over the, all over the world. So there's, there's, we know that there's expenses on that. But here's the thing. If you don't put something in the envelope, it still gets to a child. It still goes. It still goes. You know, so we put little stickers on. In fact, it's kind of interesting. One of, one of the things we do is, is we get online and we, uh, we get these little tracking labels mm -hmm. so that we can track them. So we have four different tracking labels this year because we have, we have uh, five to nine boys, five to nine girls. We have 10 to 14 boys, 10 to 14 girls. So we have four different tracking labels on these things, and we're going to see where they go. So yours also have, has a tracking label on it, and we'll see where these things go. Well, the thing is, is that if I say I want 50, they say, well, okay, you get 50. So I'll, I'll give them you know, money for 50 of them. But I can print off as many as I want to. I could say I wanted one. I, it's, it's still the same thing. It's just, it's just a sticker. And I, I just print it off on my computer. I just print it off on my computer. And I love that. Yeah. I love that in ministry, we just, we don't, don't, let's not worry about those types of things. God is the one that provides. 
God is the one that takes care of us. I can do all things through Christ. That's the context. That's the context. That's why I like the Gideon. Now, Gideons are the same way. Yeah, these ministries are wonderful. They're, they're wonderful. For those of you that come to our 11 o'clock service, you've probably heard Pastor Craig talk about the Gideons because that was his introduction to Christianity. He was on a campus. He was on a, on a college campus in Oklahoma, and somebody gave him one of those little green Gideon New Testaments. And God changed his life. God changed his life, you know? Isn't that amazing? I love these ministries. We got a different color. We got a white. Are you a Gideon? Are you a Gideon? Yes, I am. Oh, right. That's great. I love those Gideon. I love the Gideon. They do such a great job. So then he goes on. He says, For even in Thessalonians, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. The, the best way for a ministry to look at giving is giving is good for you. It's good for you. I mean, the funds come in, and the funds are needed. That's, that's great. But God can do a lot of things without any money if he wants to. But the thing is, is that it's good for you. Having that generous heart is a great way to do it. It's a great way to do it. You know, for years, uh, Carol and I, I think I told you this, that when, I was, when we first got saved, we first were involved in the church. And I, I felt I wanted to teach. You know, we, I just felt I wanted to teach. I, I didn't know this book. So the pastor very wisely said, why don't you start with something you know? And what I knew was business. And I knew, I knew finance. I worked in the treasurer's office at Ford Motor Company. And he said, you know, there's a lot of people in the church that, that want to get out of debt. They don't know how to handle money. Why don't you teach them how to get out of debt? So for years, we help people get out of debt. And one of the greatest things I learned in getting people out of debt was to teach them to be generous, to be able to understand that, that here's the thing, whether you make 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 dollars a year, you gotta be generous with what God's given you. Because if you're generous with a little, you can be, God will trust you with more. You gotta be able to be able to do that. And it really takes your, your heart off of the consumption. You know, the, most of the people that have problems with debt isn't because they have less income. It's because they spend too much. It's the same thing with our government. You know, the government debt's been going up. I don't know if you've seen that. I mean, in the last couple of years, it's going up, going up and up and up and up. And it isn't for a lack of revenue. Government revenues this last year are 4 or 5% higher than they were the year before. Four or five, let me tell you, four or five percent on two or three trillion dollars is a lot of money. But, there's, but the government's spending more money than, than it's coming in, so we have this deficit. And it's the same thing with people. People don't have an income problem, they have a spending problem. And I found that through the good news ministry, uh, uh, good news, and then also for Financial Peace uh, University, I found that by teaching people to be generous, by teaching people to be generous to be able to give, it's a great way to break that habit of consumption. Just, just give some money. Give some money. If you give money first, you, you, it starts changing your heart. This whole section is on Philippian generosity. You can see that's the, the topic there. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I, Paul, he, he's going to repeat himself here, which is typical Paulian. I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent to from you, a sweet-selling aroma and acceptable sacrifice. You'll miss that, but what he's saying is that Epaphroditus traveled from Philippi to Rome, where Paul was. And Epaphroditus, you know, this is before Western Union. This is before credit cards or bank transfers. Epaphroditus had the money with him. So the money that was picked up in Philippi was given to Epaphroditus, and they traveled probably by land as well as by water, and finally got to Rome. What would you say, Caleb? That's right, all the way. Well, there's two things. One, they sent some money to Jerusalem, and then they also sent some money to Paul in Rome. So two times. So of half days, he's, he's got the money, okay? He's got the money. It's like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, you know? You got to be careful. What do they say? Who was, it? Who was it? Was it Clyde Barrow? They asked him why he robbed banks. Money is. He said, that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> that's where the money is. I, I, was it Clyde Barrow? I can't remember who was, who was it. Was it Bonnie and Clyde that said it? Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde were asked, why do they rob banks? And, and Clyde Barrow said, that's where the money is. That's where the money is. 
Well, for Epaphroditus, I mean, he had to travel with all this money, and he got to Paul. He was able to get to Paul. Um, if, if it never got to Paul, he probably wouldn't be in the Bible. It probably, his name would, would be stricken from the records, that's for sure. I have, an, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma. You know, it's interesting. That's, there's an idea of a sweet-smelling aroma. What Paul is making reference to is the fact that in, in Judaism, the Judaism, along with the sacrifices of lambs and goats and rams and pigeons, they would also sacrifice or burn on the altar of incense uh, fruits and vegetables uh, and, and incense. That was not unusual. They would do that. So Paul is making reference that the gifts that they're giving is similar to what the Jewish people would do in sacrificing a sweet-smelling aroma to God. It was the same type of thing, that, that giving in itself was an opportunity for them to abound and to be able to, to have the benefit of this sweet-selling aroma. And he says, and he, and just to make sure you don't get that, he even says exactly what it is, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Well, so the idea is that the gifts that Paul was receiving from these people, he's saying, it's, it's been credited to your account. It's been credited to your account. Now, so here's the thing. One of the things that's interesting, if you read through the New Testament, is, is trying to understand this. And we talked a little bit about this even with the parable, is there's, there's certain things that we do. There's certain things that we're asked to do. And the, and the point is, is that when we do them, it's credited to our account. But what does that mean? Have you ever thought about that? What, is that? what does that mean, that it's been credited to your account? I mean, what kind of credit do you get? What kind of credit do you get? I mean, our goal, our objective is heaven, right? I mean, our objective is heaven, to be able to spend eternity with God. And that's our objective. And we know that that objective is only fulfilled because of what Christ does for us. There's nothing that we can do to earn that, right? If you, if you heard my little talk yesterday, the whole idea of, of heaven, it's an inheritance. It's something that's been, that's been given to us. It's not something, it's not a wage that we've earned. So if things are credited to your account, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? What, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I've always thought about that. What, is, what does it mean to, 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 to be credited to your account? You know, is it, if, if, it's, if I'm getting, what kind of credits am I getting? You know, I know that when I went to college, I needed 120 credits, right? You need 120 got credits or 124 credits in order to graduate. So I took the classes I had taken. I got credit for these classes, and I finally was able to graduate. But as a Christian, I know that there's certain things that God wants me to do. And if I'm doing those things, I know that God knows, and I know, but I'm trying to think, where is the benefit? What do you think, Talitha? Well, one way of looking at it, you think of an account as an account of something or a witnessing of something. That every time I am blessed with something that God gives me, and then I use it for his glory, so I'm able to walk, do, think, just exhibit his glory, then that's another um, account I've made of Christ. So when yeah. I go to heaven, he'd be like, yeah, I sent you all, I revealed myself to you a thousand times, and you have an account of, hopefully he'll say a thousand. <laughs> you might not. You used it all. I used it all, you know, and, and it makes me think about how sometimes people say that when, you know, they do pass from from this life, yeah. that what they can say is they used all that God gave for the glory of God. For His glory. Right. So when He when they pass, they have used it all up. I like that. I like that. You know, the Bible in other places says that you want to store up treasure in heaven, right? You want to you want to send it out ahead of you, right? Rather than building treasure on the earth, you want to send up treasure in heaven. So there's there's something there. There's some there's something there. I'm not sure exactly, I'm, and, and we could probably do a study on that. But there's, there's, there's something that's chalked up to our, our credit. I don't, think we'll, I don't think we'll be disappointed. Let's put it that way. So that could be my, my doctor. There you go. There you go. I'm sure, I'm sure there's been theological students that have written on the idea of rewards. I'm sure if we do a little research on it. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned, we mentioned um, upstairs at, at 10 o'clock, we... We, we talked a little bit about uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah. It's a beautiful day. And we see this often. We know that people that are full of the Spirit, people that are doing the things that, that Paul talks about, their life 
is different as a result. Their relationships are sweeter. I mean, I know people that have, I've had the opportunity as a couple, you know, they'll come to me as a, you know, people would come to me when I was a, as a pastor in a church, a uh, couple's fighting and they want me to settle their disputes. That's typically what marriage counseling is, you know. They, they both want you to, they want the pastor to say which one's right and which one's wrong. <laughs> That's right. And I, I learned quickly to stay out of that, you know. But, but I, I will give them what the Bible has to say about husbands loving your wife and wives, you know, uh, respect, your, respect your husband. And we will talk about what that is. And, and here's the thing is that people that start following these instructions, whether it's from Philippians or Colossians or Corinthians, they start understanding who God is and they allow that to get a hold of their life their life changes. It gets better. I mean, it isn't just passing. It gets better. Their relationships get better. Marriages are restored. Children are restored to their parents. Neighbors are restored. Things get better. We talked about Financial Peace University. Did you know that more people get divorced because of financial issues than they do of infidelity? Is that something? So if we can help them understand what God's principles are regarding money, what happens? Their life gets better. Their marriages get better. They're no longer fighting about, you know, the shiny new car in the driveway. You know, they might be driving something that's a couple of years older, but they're not fighting about it anymore. They get better. And I think that's part of this abounding to you. I think part of the idea that Paul is talking about is that when you do these things, when it's this sweet-smelling aroma, the sacrifice, God sees that. God sees that. And that, and that, makes, that makes things better, not worse, better. What are you going to say, Caleb? Cheerful. Cheerful. Yeah, you just, you, just, you just start feeling better about things all the time. It just it makes your life better. It makes the people around you better. I remember I had a, um, we were interviewing youth pastors at our church. This was a few years ago. Uh, down, at, down at Christ Fellowship that uh, Talitha went to. Um, and we were interviewing youth pastors. And one of the things we want our youth pastors to do is be able to, to give a pretty good sermon. They don't have to be accomplished. They don't have to have you know, 25 years of experience because these are younger guys and gals. But we want them to be able to, to take the scriptures and be able to, to present something. And I was really surprised because we had this young guy that was a former soccer coach. And that's what he did. He was a soccer coach. And uh, loved playing soccer. In fact, he almost went professional, except he was a little short. Wasn't tall enough, wasn't big enough to make it professionally, but he was a very good soccer player. And he used soccer a lot as his illustrations in, in, in his sermons. Well, I loved it because <clears throat> he gave us one illustration that I'll never forget. He said, you know how at the end of, the, at the end of a game, especially in America, in American football, Sometimes you'll see the winning coach is going to win the game and the guys get the big container of Gatorade, okay? And they dump it on them, right? And the coach gets all wet. And he said, well, here's the thing. He says, when you're in Christ, you're in Christ, and, and God is so pleased with what you're doing, and he's pouring out his spirit on you, pouring out your spirit. Not only do you get wet, but guess what? The people around you get wet too. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. I hired him on the spot. <laughs> the people around you get wet too. Yeah. Well, that was the thing. He just didn't have that many opportunities, but he was good. But I, but I think that's part of this as well. I think that's part of this generosity that, that Paul is talking about. But the generosity applies to, to really anything spiritual. Anything spiritual. The, the more you put into it, the more you start following what the Bible has to say about how to treat your children, how to treat your husband, how to treat your neighbor, how to treat your pastor, how to be a good citizen, to pray for the king, to pray for those in authority, all of these instructions that were given. You know, slaves serve your master. Masters don't burden your, your slaves. I mean, all of these instructions, when you start doing that, Grace starts abounding unto you. And not only do you get this, this benefit, you know, this, this fruit of the Spirit, but the people around you get it as well. It just makes things so much better. It, it really does.
It really does. So look at this, guys. We've got five minutes left. We're going to finish up. What do you think of that? Woo-hoo! Did you want to address verse 19 in terms of the health and wealth? Oh, let's do that. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in glory by Christ Jesus, now to the God and Father of our glo- be glory forever and ever. The, here's another verse that's always taken out of context. We mentioned before, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At, and verse 19 is a verse that's a wonderful verse, and there's nothing wrong with this verse. It's a verse that you can use all the time. I don't mind. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So as Pastor Hal said, this verse can get abused. Verses that are taken out of context can get abused. The the context in this is Philippians' generosity that they've been able to supply for Paul. And they've been given a couple opportunities. And out of what they had, they were able to support the ministry. And God, Paul is basically saying, and you know what? God sees that. God knows what you're doing. God is able to supply all your need according to his riches. You know, you don't have to worry about giving your last dollar to somebody in need because because God's going to be able to know that. Don't worry about your last dollar. God God supplies that. What did you think you got that in the first place? You can't outgive God. And I think that's the context. As he supports me, so he will. Absolutely. The means by which he chooses to do that may differ. Exactly right. He will never leave me. Right. Right. And remember, in this, Paul says, God will supply all your needs, in parentheses, like he supplied mine. And what did Paul just tell us about seven verses before? I was hungry. I was abased. I was so low, I was playing handball against the curb. That's what he was saying. And God can supply you in the same way, in the same way. So God will supply your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. There you go. Yep. Get you up in the morning, that's for sure. Get you out of the house and get to church or get to here at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Paul, Paul ends up, just two, two more verses. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with you, me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are in Caesar's household. You know, Paul... Paul goes out of his way in each one of the letters to do a couple of things. One is that he's always so generous. He always talks about how he prays for them all the time. He wants to encourage them. But, he, but, he, but he's building the body of Christ. He mentions people by name. He tells them from his heart that, that we love you. They send their greetings. Uh, we, we know who you are. We greet you by name. What a wonderful way for churches to communicate with each other to be of one spirit and one body. And remember, remember these, all of these, if you take a look at Philippians and Colossians and Corinthians, some of these, some of these letters, they start off kind of dark. You know, Paul's, Paul's writing to them. He wants to get their attention ahead of time. He's got to remind them sometimes, hey, you don't have many fathers. I'm one of your fathers, so you got to listen to me. I mean, Paul is, Paul is telling them some hard things. But in it, he always has this heart, this heart of being able to, to let them know that the church is love each other. They, they care for each other. They greet every saint. You know, it's like, I, I love it. A, a couple of the churches I went to, we all called each other brother and sister. And I loved it because we didn't have to remember names. You know, you don't have to remember names. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. That's great. But it was, but it was a good feeling. It was still a good feeling. And that's what Paul's doing. He says, greet every saint. Greet, greet every saint um, in, in Christ Jesus. Uh, we talked about that once before. Remember this idea of saints. In the, in, the early, in the early church, um, one of the words that was used was the word martyr. And martyr really just means witness. But so many of these witnesses died that it was difficult to use the word martyr for witness anymore. So martyr took on a separate meaning, meaning these were the ones that were the holy ones that actually gave their life. Same thing happened with the word saint. In the early church, if you were a church member, You were a saint. You were part of the body of Christ. You were a saint. As time went on, many of these saints died because of martyrdom. And as the church grew and as the church got, as the church matured, let's put it that way, as the church matured in the second and third century, it became less favorable or less common to call members in the church saints because so many of those old time saints had died. You don't want to put yourself on the same level. So they they started calling them different things. 
but it's kind of resurrected a little bit. It's kind of resurrected. We want to be able to understand that, that yeah, that's the saints are the people in the church. They're people that, that understand who Christ Jesus is. Um, again, we, we mentioned it before, but Caesar's household, let me tell you, there weren't many good Caesars, okay? I mean, even, even the good ones were nasty. I mean, I mean in, order for, in order for a person to, to achieve that kind of, of uh, leadership, whether it was the governor of a province or whether it was a king or a Caesar and stuff like that, people were always after you. And these, and these people, they killed their enemies. They, they wiped them out. We see this in the Old Testament. We see, you know, they went after all of Saul's household. They want to kill them all, kill all of them. You know, one of the brothers would become the king, so he would kill his other brothers to make sure that nobody was there to be able to take his throne. And that's what the Caesars did. That's what the Caesars did. Paul, he's ministering to these people. He's ministering to these people and teaching them about Jesus Christ. Talk about, talk about a culture shock, you know, to go from Caesar's household to the household of God. That's, that's a culture shock. That's, that's something different. Um, then Paul ends up, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Paul always had this wonderful way of being able to kind of wrap it up. In fact, a lot of times at the end of our services, we give our benedictions. Benediction is, is two Greek words meaning to speak well. And we quote often from these, these letters of Paul. Paul always had this wonderful way of wrapping things up at the end. You know, the grace of the Lord God Almighty, you know, who, who always is there to be able to give you every grace and allow you to abound in all good measures. The peace of God be with you. That's how Paul ends these letters. This is one of the shorter, let, shorter greetings. That's salutation. That's salutation, right. Yeah. Beautiful way that he wrote. Beautiful way that he wrote. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. It's, uh, it's been such a pleasure, Lord, to be able to go through the, the book of Philippians. You've been listening to Faith Dialogue with Pastor Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of Faith Dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.